Welcome, and thank you for joining us today in this special event in the Hoover Institution's project on China's Global Shark Power Speaker Series. As many of you know who join us from time to time, in addition to regular speakers on topics of urgent interest with regard to China, the CGSP project also publishes a series of reports on issues of the day. Uh, today, we're rolling out one of those reports, um, a really uh, vital um, contribution from Matt Johnson, uh, who is a visiting fellow here at the Hoover Institution on China's data strategy. Many of us are aware that there's a large national conversation in the United States regarding TikTok and whether it should be free to do business in the United States or there should be restrictions on TikTok's ability to do business and collect data on Americans. But that is only the beginning of the conversation and the tip of the iceberg. As Matt is about to tell us, TikTok is part of a much larger strategy that's been put together at the highest reaches of the Chinese government with regard to controlling the world's data using its commercial platforms. Platforms. This is much more than just TikTok and social media. This is about the collection of data for economic intelligence, for contributions to generative AI models, uh, for weather forecasting that will help with military planning, for weather forecasting that will help with forecasting atmospheric conditions for hypersonic missiles. Um, I want you. I want to refer you all to Hoover's and CGSP's website. That's www.hoover.org/cgsp, where you can download a free copy of today's report. But without further ado, let me introduce Matt Johnson, who will describe it to you. Matt Johnson's a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution and research director at Garneau Global. His expertise covers China's global. China's contemporary elite politics, strategic thinking, and political control over the financial sector and private economy. He was previously a lecturer in the history and politics of modern China at the University of Oxford, and his academic publications have focused on propaganda, Chinese Communist Party, ideology, cultural security, state society relations, and the Cold War. Of interest to us is he participated in a Hoover working group on digital currencies and electronic payments and in the report that Hoover issued on digital currencies last year. And most recently, he's the co-author of a study on TikTok that was submitted to the Australian Parliament. Matt, over to you. Thank you, Glenn, for that warm uh, introduction and um, very succinct overview uh, of the report um, that we've just published today on uh, China's grand strategy for global data dominance. Thank you everyone for <coughs> coming today. And um, those who are listening, your attention is much appreciated. I wanted to say thank you in particular uh, to Larry Diamond, head of the uh, China's Global Sharp Power Project among his many roles, uh, to Glenn Tiffert. Um, also uh, with the same program and, and also for new colleague uh, Francis Hisgen, uh, who is also at CGSP and, and the three of them together have uh, edited this report um, since its conception basically and I'm incredible great, uh, incredibly grateful to them for their support and thoughtful um, review. And then finally, I wanna thank the Hoover Institution itself, uh, the Hoover <laughs> Press and folks um, who do publicity for Hoover, who have really, again, uh, helped to roll this out in an engaging way. So the report is long, uh, it's fairly detailed, has a lot of footnotes. I'm a historian by background. Um, you know, I read a lot, uh, I, I, I like sources. I've tried to immerse myself in as many sources that seem relevant to this uh, question as I possibly could. And I've tried to put them together in a way that connects as clearly as possible uh, what Glenn just described, which is elite policymaking within you know, the upper echelons of the party, starting with Xi Jinping, and then how that policymaking has cascaded downward uh, through China's party state and then moved outward from China into the world. Uh, through uh, commercial actors, um, companies for the most part, and how all of this fits together to form uh, not an entirely coherent whole, but a fairly, I think, powerful and active network for data absorption that policymakers in the United States and other countries are really just beginning to catch up to in terms of its breadth and ambition. 
So that's my starting point. Um, because the report is long and fairly detailed, uh, what I want to do with this event, um, which you know has a good seminar feel to it, uh, which I also appreciate, uh, is is two things essentially. For for those whose time and attention spans are limited. Um, I, I want to give an overview of the main argument and supporting takeaways, including key policy recommendations, um, which basically summarizes the report, but won't get too deeply into the weeds. And then for those who are still around after that, uh, I, I want to give a more um, methodological overview of what I think are some of the key issues that arise in the course of this kind of research. Because one of the main points that I want to make today isn't just about data but it's actually that the party state and the Chinese Communist Party in particular has a long history, is a unique organization, is unlike other nation state actors and requires, I think, you know, a very different kind of research methodology in order to fully capture the, the, the breadth and intricacy of um, its, its organization. And then for the third part, uh, we, we, we have a cue, I'll, I'll, you know, do questions, obviously, starting with Glenn, who's an old friend, also from the, the history uh, <coughs> days. So the, the top line of this report, which is basically given away by the title, is that China has a grand strategy for global data dominance. That's, that's a fact. I think it's an empirically verifiable fact. Um, but the implications of that fact require some spelling out. And so... I thought actually one way to get into that might be just to break down the words in the title itself so that we understand uh, what we're talking about here and the terminology involved. So when we talk about China, we're talking basically, you know, we're starting with China's leaders, the very top of the Chinese Communist Party, who see their country, and this is part of what the report proves, uh, starting with current Supreme Leader Xi Jinping, as engaged in a global contest for, dis for, for uh, control of digital information, i.e. data. And that she, for example, foreshadowed this competition explicitly himself in 2013, right after coming to power, when he told the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the vast ocean of data, just like oil resources during industrialization, contains immense productive power and opportunities. Whoever controls big data technologies will control the resources and initiative for development. So this is Xi at the very you know, start of his, his now lengthy uh, tenure as general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, comparing data to oil as a vital resource that China basically needs to uh, control and absorb in order to um, achieve its, uh, and really the party's strategic objectives. And as the report shows, she has personally led this policy of data control through the creation of what I've called the party's accumulation espionage system, which in simplest terms is a network of internal storage and processing facilities, some of which have been uh, created and controlled by China's own security, by the, the party's own security forces, um, and how these are coupled with policies in areas ranging from big data to civil military fusion to e-commerce that leverage civilian institutions and commercial actors to act as siphons abroad, feeding into military, commercial, and other technology and surveillance development projects back in China, or which may potentially be shared with other like-minded actors around the world, for example, Iran or Russia. So China here is a political actor i.e. the Chinese Communist Party of 96 million members, plus a military, plus others who knowingly or unknowingly support these agendas uh, and, and who are engaged in the competitive accumulation of data at a global scale. The second element in the title, grand strategy, which basically means here that winning the global contest as China's leaders envision it, uh, is to use of all available tools of statecraft <clears throat> In, in pursuit of uh, this big data agenda. One of the central claims that the report makes and proves is that in China's Leninist party state, these tools include private companies, which are under the party's organizational control, even if they appear to be privately held, and which are obliged to uphold party policies, uh, including as these relate to data. Finally, what is meant by global data dominance? 
This is Beijing's non-reciprocal approach to data, which means that its companies and domestic data processing systems exploit the openness of other countries, including via multilateral trade agreements, to accumulate as much data about other societies as possible while maintaining barriers uh, around access to China's own data. And I would add that while uh, leaders like Xi Jinping have been vague about what they intend to do with this data uh, and the infrastructure being built to process it, some indication of uh, the, the, the potential um, of this project can be gleaned from two kinds of sources, uh, which this report documents fully. The first is authoritative party state official text. So like I said, there's a lot of reading uh, behind the research, including directives from top leaders uh, on, and instructions on implementation and actually the, the law itself, um, which isn't independent of the party, but basically shifts in accordance with um, party goals and priorities. What these say, which the report spells out, is that Beijing is building a nationally integrated big data system. They say that data, which is uh, created and absorbed from other, from other countries, will be used uh, for China's economic and military advantage. They say that data is viewed as a means of constant and omnipresent surveillance, both for state security purposes at home and for military and military adjacent actors abroad. And they say that all data gathered via PRC entities, whether corporations or individuals, is subject to the collection and review of party state authorities. The second type of sources that the report covers uh, pretty much at, at, at the front, uh, at, at Larry's urging to bring some of the points about uh, relevance home, which, which I, th I think was a wise move, are um, actual harms already being conducted by PRC commercial data handlers abroad. So in other words, we're not talking about hypotheticals. We're talking about uh, you know, actual evidence of ways in which data is being used. These include building databases of human genomes without consent. They include mapping sensitive areas of other countries, economic activity, borders. Uh, they include mining telecommunications networks for commercial secrets and intelligence. They include the manipulation of online information environments. They include the profiling of foreign citizens through social media, and they include targeting journalists and uh, those engaged in activities which are critical of China and of um, PRC companies, including reports like this one. <clears throat> I also want to highlight a further point about data itself, which is to say that data is not simply personal information. So I've you know, recently been reading dismissals, even among those who are you know, kind of vaguely critical of uh, party state behavior in other areas saying, you know, there's, there's too much attention being paid to TikTok. You know, what, what really is the strategic advantage of information gleaned via TikTok, which I think somewhat uh, minimizes the, the problem. I mean, one, in response, I would say that data can include personal information, which ultimately is, is hardly trivial. Uh, including because it may be used in the future in ways that are difficult to envision in, in the present, whether for uh, micro-targeting of online messaging, digital messaging, or, or other forms of leverage. Um, but the data can also mean information about environments and patterns of activity, uh, which are collected through sensing technology like LIDAR, you know, on most autonomous vehicles that you see, especially in a technology-rich area like, like this one. Um, it can refer to uh, control signals transmitted through networked smart systems to autonomous vehicles, industrial equipment, power grids, and other deep infrastructure underpinning our economy. It can refer to entire environments of information, for example, social media, uh, content platform algorithms, and potentially um, generative AI created knowledge ecosystems. And finally, it can refer to more traditional forms of information stored in digital form, like uh, blueprints, confidential documents, state secrets, institutional and individual records, et cetera, all of which are targets of traditional espionage only now digitized. This is why, as the report shows, the challenges posed to the United States and other countries, uh, democracies certainly, but any country, with a long-term vision of national security, which is to say most or all countries, um, 
the, the challenges posed to all of these countries by China's digital dominance strategy are not simply confined to protecting the data of individuals from commercial data risk, but should be, uh, but should include the protection of networks, the protection of institutions, and in particular, the protection of critical sectors of the economy from integration with PRC commercial data operators. And so the examples that the report draw, uh, draws on, though far from complete, cover a wide range of areas, including drones and autonomous vehicles, uh, including biotech and genomics, social media. Uh, I've, I've done other work, as Glenn mentioned, on um, financial technology, including cryptocurrencies. All of these um, you know, have the potential to play outsized roles in impacting national security, especially when influenced by a foreign adversary, which from a strategic perspective is how the United States uh, government views China, which is a point that I'll come back to later. So the policy recommendations that the report makes are broad because the challenge is broad here. Um, one is to, is, to, is to review and strategically decouple. So the, at the top of this list is strengthening and expanding the U.S. Department of Commerce's Information and Communications Technology and Services process, also not known as the ICTS process, to restrict data-related transactions which pose undue or unacceptable risks to U.S. national security. Um, the, the report goes into how the ICTS panel was first conceived under the Trump administration and then further uh, clarified under U.S. President Joe Biden has broad discretion to begin investigating and unwinding threats across six sectors, including critical infrastructure, network infrastructure, data hosting, uh, surveillance and monitoring technology, communication software, and emerging technology. So not just social media apps, which are a, rel uh, a relatively recent addition. Through the ICTS process, um, commerce has already begun reviewing transactions but it has not visibly enacted its, its authority beyond the review level. Nonetheless, it does represent a powerful tool for confronting foreign adversary threats to data across society and, the potential, and, and represents the potential basis for comprehensive protection of information and infrastructure. However, as critics or at least commentators have, note, have, note, have noted, as a commerce-led process, it has been assessed to lack the resources and clarity of scope to begin systematically reducing risk across the economy. A second potential solution is to restrict investment, um, to, to basically start with uh, creating a list of which parts of the economy are most in need of being secured and which commercial data operators represent the, the clearest threats. And uh, from that point, the challenge of China's data dominance strategy can be met by streamlining the process through which foreign investment in critical data technology and infrastructure sectors is reviewed. The report therefore recommends a clearer approve or reject model for covered transactions by the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States or CFIUS and clearer restrictions on foreign adversary controlled investment in critical technology and supply chain areas. Mm -hmm. A third recommendation is to strengthen the international ecosystem for data security. Um, by, by joining multilateral frameworks, such as Japan's uh, data free flow with trust proposal, which I think is, is worth uh, careful study. Um, there's the possibility to strengthen data protection between allied and partner countries so that security shortcomings affecting the sale and transfer of data abroad, including the integrity of data communication systems and including data shared via non-commercial transactions such as uh, international research partnerships are addressed. And then finally, although I have to say that in the current environment, uh, this, this um, is, uh, I wouldn't say absurd, but sort of in the category of wishful thinking, although you know, I think it, it is a world that we all should wish for, uh, there's the option of trying to impose uh, terms of reciprocity and engagement on the government in Beijing, which would mean that making access to America's company's investment and market conditional on a more reciprocal attitude toward data and transparency that goes beyond 
superficial cybersecurity pledges, which sort of represent the current state of US-China discussion in this area, and would require actual proof of commitment in order for PRC companies to continue operating in the United States and to continue receiving investment from the United States. So to conclude this part of the presentation, um, I think that you know we in the United States of America and democratic partners need to begin to close the gap between understanding that China's party state army, there's always that third term, is a, is a foreign adversary that seeks to compete with and displace the United States and democratic systems as principal stakeholders in the international system through conflict, if necessary. If you've watched uh, uh, China's recent sort of quasi-war mobilization uh, policies and, and operations closely, um, we, we need to close the gap between that reality and policies that give almost unfettered access to sensitive domestic information and systems to companies that are controlled by that foreign adversary. So that's the gap. It's, it's, it's that simple. To defend our principles and institutions and competitiveness, this gap, the report argues, needs to be addressed immediately. So if you're staying just for the top lines and the main takeaways, uh, we, we've basically concluded that part of the presentation, and, and uh, I would thank you for your attention. <clears throat> but for others, those in the room, and particularly uh, fellow researchers and analysts, I just wanted to dive a, a, a little deeper using the time remaining to talk about some of the methodological features of the report. Now, this, this part is less scripted. Uh, really, I just want to make my own assumptions clear because there's a real debate about how we can study the party state and other China-linked actors like companies or think tanks or overseas united front groups or you know the legal police stations in, in in New York City and how you know how we should go about mapping out the ways in which all these parts of, of the party kind of connect with one another. So I just want to make a couple of methodological points that hopefully will spark some further discussion. One is that open source is important and you have to read a lot of open source material. And you have to know how to get online and search for it, and you have to know how to, you know, collect and analyze. And I think, as you know, uh, those or for those researching and analyzing the party or its, you know, policies and activities in specific areas, there's a sense in which we can't really overspecialize. I mean, I haven't spent my whole career studying China's data policy, but I think, as you know, a, a start for understanding that policy, we need to read what's available and begin to put it together in ways that tell the story from the perspective of the actors using actors categories. Second point I would make is that what leaders say is important, right? So when we talk about China, we talk about China's policies. Uh, I would say even when we talk about Beijing, what Beijing thinks, Really, we have to focus a little in, in, in a more granular fashion on the, the, the people who are the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, because their speeches in China's system essentially have the authority of, of law, right? When she says something, it cascades down through the party state system, which is a, which is a Leninist system in terms of its organizational DNA. And it means that every time she speaks, we should probably pay attention because it's a it's a fast moving system it's it's not just a slow moving you know kind of ossified bureaucracy a third point which i've sort of foreshadowed here is that china's political system is leninist and increasingly centralized this means that policies move from top to bottom this means that society is increasingly integrated into the state and while uh, the party's control over society is not perfect all of the available evidence says that the goal is control and coordination. That the vision is of a single political organism that moves in a perfectly coordinated manner. You don't have to take my word for it because these are all the things that Xi Jinping says about, you know, top level planning and, you know, the big chess board and, uh, you know, everybody having one, one will and one sense of purpose. That's, that's what political discourse in China sounds like today. 
The other also somewhat foreshadowed here is that China's political language is not transparent. It has to be understood better. The, the terms and phrases that are awkward to translate can't just be dismissed as ideological and empty out of hand because we don't necessarily understand what they mean. We have to bring specialist knowledge to bear on these you know, sort of opaque and esoteric documents in order to understand what the purpose behind them actually is. Also, and this is, you know, focused on, I think, one of the central claims of the report concerning corporations, um, that because of the unique features of the party as an organization, control at the corporate level doesn't actually just mean ownership. And controllers may be hard to identify because of the party's own norms of secrecy. You don't know where in a company, you know, the real sort of nodes of party control lie. They get moved around, um, sometimes in the human resources department, you know, sometimes in, in other parts of uh, corporate structures. And that also requires actually a fairly forensic approach in order to, to understand and draw out. All party controlled organizations are by definition non-transparent. And so we need to get better at identifying the points of contact that make lines of control visible. <clears throat> Two more points and then I'll wrap up. Um, one is that for, for those whose work focuses on uh, the forensic reconstruction of the strategic policy and organizational landscapes as I've described them above, behavior also matters. I think there's you know a bit of a gap and I, in some ways I, I can see it at times in my own work between you know, what, what the words say and what the behavior on the ground looks like. So in other words, uh, building threat images requires some actual proof of threat. And so in this report, I've actually relied fairly heavily on the work of uh, credible investigative journalists who pay attention to what companies do versus just what the, the, the party says. And you know, their, their work and their conclusions and you know, the work of, of the, the, the media and the investigative media are extremely important for this kind of effort. Finally, the party's roots as an underground organization, which is what it was, have fundamentally shaped the kind of organization that it is today. And whether we acknowledge it or not, we are locked into a competition between open democratic societies and status totalitarian societies at a global level. It is impossible after years of you know, reading the ideology coming out of Beijing, out of states of Russia, uh, like, like, like Russia, uh, that you know, to, to avoid the conclusion that leaders in those countries see the current global uh, situation as one of direct confrontation and struggle, you know, which basically threatens to escalate with every passing day. The Chinese Communist Party has been purpose built and refined to exploit openness by moving in ways that exploit laws around privacy, reputation, ownership, and individual rights and liberties to achieve uh, political ends by undermining other nations' sovereignty. You know, so when we talk about lawfare, we're not just talking about salami slicing in the South China Sea. Xi Jinping convenes the party's political legal commission once a year to talk about you know, how to negotiate other countries' laws and how to use their laws to achieve China's broader international goals. There's a, I, I'm happy to share you know, research that I've done on, on this topic as well. It's interesting. And this is why, you know, the, the party's history is an underground organization. And then it's, you know, kind of coming into full view during uh, the, the war with Japan, China's civil war, um, and then how that process spilled into perceived victories against the United States in Korea in the early 1950s is a kind of process that Xi Jinping is constantly bringing party members attention back to in terms of the party's internal ideology and doctrine. So this complex challenge requires a revival uh, to, to conclude of um, specialized research, 
of course, the researchers always say that, but, um, you know, uh, and analysis techniques to defend national security and principles of democracy and openness in a, competi in a competition that has already started. And in this sense, study of data and China's grand strategy for data is a, is a case study. I don't think it's, it's the last word, but it's a case study which highlights the gap, the current gap that exists between the complexity of the challenge and the current response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I want to invite those of you in the in-person audience, but also on the Zoom audience to, um, to field questions. Um, but, uh, and while you do that, um, please, those of you in the Zoom audience, um, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Um, while you do that, I, I have a couple of comments, uh, reflections, and then I'll prime the pump with a question, uh, and then we can build up a queue. Um, in many ways, I think this report is a model of the kind of research and methodology that Matt just described. For those of you who have not seen it yet, and it is downloadable, um, it begins with sort of the top level findings that he just articulated to you, but then in phenomenal granular detail, it describes exactly the picture that he just painted um, so that it becomes almost undeniable, really, that there is a much larger play going on here than many people have traditionally appreciated. Not almost. <laughs> Not almost. Very well. Um, but, you know, so, so this, I think, is, is a model for how the work can be done. Um, a, a comment about um, something that I think really bounces off of, of what Matt said. In many ways, I think China's data strategy is a modernization of something that's extremely old in Marxist parties. Many of you will, will know that there was the fantasy back in the Soviet period of creating the perfectly rational economy uh, that Soviet state planners could, could predict and, and direct every small widget that went into Soviet production, where it needed to go, when it needed to go. And of course, this was a tremendous disaster, even though they had tens of thousands of people trying to do it. Xi Jinping's approach to this, and cybernetics has been an ongoing interest of, of Marxist parties around the world. Xi Jinping really believes that big data can solve this problem. And it's breathed new life into that old idea that you can create the perfectly rational society um, and perfectly managed society that the party sits on top of and controls. Uh, and underneath that idea, that, that that revitalized idea sits this enormous apparatus of data centers and big data collection that's truly global uh, in its scope. And that is what's informing a, a great deal of this strategy. This is just my perspective. I'm curious to hear Matt's reflections on that. And then let me pose a, a question to Matt. Um, I'm really glad to hear that that Matt mentions the multilateral piece of this, particularly um, building trusted networks with allies and partners, coordinating with Japan and our European allies, because I think that's critical. The solutions that one formulates in a bilateral context may look very different than the solutions that we come up with in a multilateral context. And in particular, Matt, I want to ask you, you know, one of, one of the big frustrations in this area dealing with global data and technology has been that our European partners have tended actually to hold American firms to much higher standards uh, of enforcement than they've held Chinese firms. Uh, I, and I wonder, how do we tackle that problem? Um, why is Europe actually seeing the United States as more of a threat um, than it's seeing China? Um, so let me pose that. <clears throat> Any, well, I mean, I, <laughs> I would have a hard time speaking for Europe broadly. Um, I guess I can relay odd pieces of anecdotal evidence that may help answer this question. I think the fact that the United States is so powerful, you know, still as a technological innovator, um, seems from an economic and development perspective to be, oddly enough, you know, the more serious economic threat uh, when comparing the US and China. And the discussion on the national security side of the threat is definitely moving forward. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's been years, if not a good decade plus of uh, China making inroads into sensitive systems, uh, you know, through procurement, 
through commercial transactions, you know, through fairly low level activity. It's not like PRC companies like Huawei are showing up and saying we, we have a master plan to, you know, absorb all your data. And, you know, I think that would be putting it somewhat strongly anyway. But at the same time, um, I think that it's 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 two conversations really. One is about you know, the, the the U.S. as a as an economic competitor, and then China as a potential national security threat. But also, you know, and I've spent a little time talking to, to people in various European countries about this. Uh, a more distant national security threat, like they're so far away, we don't trade with them as much as we trade with the United States. You know, they're they're not as big a they're, they're not as important, you know, as, as, as big as they are, they're not as important a country for us. But nonetheless, the areas in which the trade is taking place might nonetheless be very, very critical. But I think those conversations are starting. You know, the, the U.S. government is talking to allies and I think trying to raise some of those security concerns in, in ways that aren't sensational, but really just highlight, you know, the uh, risks involved with procuring your, you know, strategically or from a national security perspective, sensitive sensing technology, for example, from Chinese providers. Larry. Well, I'll just preface my question by saying in the digital age, it doesn't matter if you're next door or 10,000 miles away. <laughs> it's uh, ge geography has been turned upside down. Um, I think it would be helpful um, to people here and people listening to have you elaborate on the risk side of things, and maybe even in some fairly granular detail. A lot of people, particularly a lot of young people, but I think users of digital systems, social media and so on, <clears throat> of every age group have just become, frankly, resigned and apathetic to the fact that their data is available. Well, there's no immediate evidence that their lives have changed as a result of it. Everybody has it. Um, I frequently hear, well, why should we worry particularly at TikTok? Facebook has my data as well. Why should we worry that the Chinese government has my data? The US government pr can probably get it from Facebook as well. Um, so China has my genetic data, you know, so what? Um, can you uh, give us some more granular and graphic insights into why people should worry at various levels about um, China getting um, and being able to amass and analyze and aggregate and store forever their personal data? And then can you also say something about how all of this relates to the race uh, uh, to take a, potentially a permanent lead in artificial intelligence? Yes. Uh, and and um, <laughs> let me start uh, by uh, moving to the personal data question sort of second. And I think starting with some of the bigger political and economic issues um, that you know might seem distant to you know at least somewhat distant to people who are uh, younger and just you know sort of like finding their footing in society, et cetera, um, but that could potentially have long-term ramifications. One which we really focused on in the TikTok report was not so much personal data, although it's clear that the app may be able to access permissions across your device uh, that are you know, not necessarily confined just to your behavior within the TikTok app. So that's, that's one issue is, you know, is it really just TikTok the app and I only need to be worried about what you know, I, I do or say via that app? Or is it more like a kind of Trojan horse that might be able to uh, you know, access other features of my personal device in direct ways that I don't want it to. Um, you know, and, and there are some interesting uh, questions now being raised about fast fashion companies, uh, Shine or Shein and uh, Tumu, um, you know, for, for their uh, basically like asking 
young people to trade uh, their data from other apps for discounts, et cetera, which I think actually says a lot about the agenda there. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, that, that, that kind of app behavior. In other words, the app is not just the app. And I think that's an important point to make. Um, and, you know, while I, I think that young people uh, are obviously facile with technology and, you know, I have two kids and they are much quicker than me, pretty much everything. But, um, you know, the uh, truth also is that unless you really are a technologist and unless you do a forensic study of the behavior of these applications, there's probably a lot that you don't know about them, you know, no, no matter how adept you are at using technology. And so it's, it's good that we study these things and it's, it's good that we put that information out there. But on the political and, and economic points that I mentioned, you know, one which we found in the TikTok report was that in addition to the, you know, like leveling up of privileges, uh, like inside of your phone, there's also uh, app behavior in terms of search results, in terms of the like perspectives that are, that are, uh, privileged concerning specific sensitive issues. You know, for example, our, our study focused mainly on issues uh, that are sensitive from the perspective of China's government in Beijing and found that the results skewed way toward uh, uh, views that were much more in line with official policies than not. And if you're a young person in this country, I think you need to ask yourself what an app like that does to your understanding of the world, your ability to consume information in more or less, you know, free ways that, that you want to consume it in. And, um, you know, finally, uh, what kind of impact that may have on the political system of the country that you live in, you know, given that we are in a pretty contentious, uh, to put it mildly, time uh, as a nation. And, um, you know, how then information shapes viewpoints, shapes behavior, et cetera, in the context of the political process is significant. And so, you know, to have a foreign adversary control an app that is increasingly used by younger people for news information in the context of a democratic election seems dangerous. It just seems dangerous, you know, and it doesn't seem like it's going to help the national conversation much at all because it's it's clear and it's been clear for as it's been clear for Russia also that internal division in the United States suits China's foreign policy objectives just fine you know because it it in a sense limits uh unity and potentially you know action to uh respond to specific um threats both internal and and external so that's the political side i think economically also um, you know, this is probably hard for Americans to digest uh, based on history, but there is no guarantee of unlimited future economic growth. And, uh, you know, I think the, the economic threat that uh, China and other countries pose to the United States through espionage, you know, it's, it's, it's not through fair competition, but through espionage, through uh, data harvesting that is non-reciprocal. Uh, you know, the attempt to uh, develop emerging technologies sort of on the back of American economic activity, th that those trends do not lead to an economic future that favors the United States. And so your own, you know, personal circumstances, economically, uh, professionally, et cetera, you know, those of uh, people who come after you are all affected by these sorts of decisions that we make in the present to just be apathetic or ignore. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I would begin answering that very complex question, Larry. Uh, you know, I, on AI, uh, I'm not an AI expert. Um, you know, I've done a little bit of computing. Uh, one of the great laws of computing is garbage in, garbage out. Um, you know, so it's not necessarily that all raw data automatically leads to, you know, sort of great strides in AI, but certainly, uh, you know, the ability to train um, machines on large data sets uh, improves their performance, uh, you know, along with other kinds of, of ways of improving the technology. So, um, you know, we're in the midst of a, of a 
global conversation right now about chat GPT and, you know, the ramifications <laughs> of godlike artificial intelligence, uh, you know, that, that, that may be throwing forward a bit too far, but, you know, at the same time, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't think that we should treat this as an unserious problem. David. Uh, Matt, thank you. Just, just a general question. Uh, you mentioned um, some arguments that maybe there's too much attention being paid to things like TikTok. It's consumer facing. Of course, it's an obvious example. Uh, might you draw out a couple examples from your report of other data streams where you think it's sort of off people's radar or the policy conversation has not yet gotten around to it? There's a lot of buzz these days on, on ports and logistics, for example. I'm curious what you found. Right, right. So that's that's a great question. Um, I mean, ports and other critical infrastructure that increasingly play a role in, you know, the, the lifeblood of the economy. I think drones, autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, so not yet stuff that's widely used. Um, all of these are areas where China linked or Chinese companies have made pretty considerable inroads. And so the report focuses on drones and it focuses on two companies, DJI and Autel. And, you know, I think based on the research that I've done, based on speaking to people in those industries, um, you know, the way that AV works, the way that sensing technology works, uh, has a range of national security implications from controllability, you know, the ability to use the equipment in regular and predictable ways if, uh, you know, it can be controlled externally, um, which, you know, given software, given the network nature of equipment uh, is a real threat um, to just the amount of economically important and strategically important information that could be, you know, gleaned through uh, AV vehicles, essentially, you know, like mapping U.S. national infrastructure and activity, uh, you know, on that infrastructure. In other words, it's basically two things, really. It's basically and potentially uh, a giant intelligence collection tool, you know, networks of autonomous vehicles, whether whether drones or cars or trucks. Um, and it is also, in a sense, uh, a risk in terms of the software and the processing and the potential for, uh, you know, those features of our infrastructure to be linked in ways that are not fully uh, understood to um, entities outside of the United States. So there's a control issue and there's a sort of information collection issue that I think, you know, th those are important streams, so to speak, to focus on. Uh, Larry mentioned genomics also, mm -hmm. that's, that's in the report. You know, I think there's been a lot of, um, you know, uh, non-consensual collection of genetic and other information that's come to light. Again, you know, not through my research, but through the, the, the reporting of people who focus closely on these things. And in healthcare also, uh, you know, there I think the risks are somewhat commercial. You know, the development of new um, pharmaceuticals that uh, companies around the world are striving to uh, develop right now, uh, you know, to, to cure cancer, to cure uh, genetic uh, illness. Um, so, you know, that's more the commercial argument. But if, if we want to continue to be a competitor in those spaces, I think. Um, it's worth thinking about where the data in those kind of partnerships and in the use of those products uh, actually goes. You know, I've again been been told by people in the biotech space that uh, genetically, you know, sort of targeted weapons are not likely in the near future. And so, you know, I, I, I know that one gets thrown out a lot, and there may not be as much credibility to it, just as you know, the commercial threat of data that supports innovation, um, you know, not, uh, not being shared in ways that are, that are obvious or transparent. Terry. Uh, Please speak into the mic. Okay. Data are converted into information about the conditional 
outcomes of the events of the future by way of a model of a physical system, the physical system that one wants to establish control over. And I happen to know that our country is extremely bad at doing that. This is essentially what I do research on. It's so bad that in the case of climate change, the climate models by which the United States attempts to regulate uh, the outcomes of events for Earth's climate system conveys no information about the outcomes of those events to the government. Therefore, the government cannot really regulate that system. Well, if you extrapolate that to uh, foreign affairs, it's very worrisome to me. And I have <clears throat> some evidence of the fact that we are very poor at doing doing uh, that kind of, of model building. And so are, is the Chinese Communist Party. So you've got two organizations, both uh, armed with thermonuclear weapons, threatening each other with their nuclear weapons, who are using models and making policy decisions uh, that, that that convey no information to them. I really worry about that. So if I could brief you in detail and my knowledge of that, I would be delighted to uh, help you. I'd, I'd I'd be very grateful. I mean, it's it's true. There are uh, scenarios you know that we have to contemplate now that weren't necessarily on the radar even five years ago. By which an information theoretically optimal model can be created by uh, in the construction of a uh, model, which I have done many times and know all about. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation. Good. Thank you. Nick, please. No, thanks. So, and Matt, thanks for a, a great presentation. Uh, I think a very timely piece of work. Um, I just thought I'd make a comment and then ask you a question. Uh, speaking as a European, and there are some Brits that still declare themselves to be <laughs> Europeans, amazingly. Um, I think, um, if I may say so, holding a mirror up to the United States, I think sometimes you make the mistake of thinking that Europe is a homogenous entity. Uh, and um, certainly the remarks that a certain president has made in the course of the last week in France um, perhaps might be conceived to be a European comment. They're not really, I don't think. I mean, Eastern Europe takes a very different perspective. And indeed, the Prime Minister of Estonia has just written a really good article in The Economist, having given a speech in Australia about cyber and protecting our data and everything associated with it, because Estonia has a lot of experience in all of this. Um, I think part of it, though, is European naivety. And that's why I think your report should be very timely. And I hope it gets widely read throughout European countries, not least as I was reading the other day that the German Cyber Command is using Huawei technology inside its own base databases, which is pretty extraordinary. But my question is, do you, do you recommend in the report that the US should have a grand strategy to deal with this? Um, because your policy recommendations seem to be extraordinarily sound, but I wonder whether they should also be nested in a grand strategy, which we can all get behind. That's a, a fantastic observation. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it should. And I have to say that in, you know, the kind of quest to ground the conclusions in, you know, ways that would appeal to policymakers, the, the, the grand strategy part uh, probably dropped out a bit, but it's something I would have to give more thought to. I think, you know, as a, as a fundamental principle, as painful as it sounds, it seems that the almost logical conclusion is uh, accelerating decoupling in strategically important areas, you know, a sort of broader version of rip and replace where, you know, they're just the, the, the threat to critical infrastructure it seems now, and not just critical infrastructure in a sort of, um, you know, more narrow national security sense, but the systems that are required, you know, to sustain societies and to sustain economic growth uh, are vulnerable in ways that I'm not sure that policy has caught up to yet. And that, you know, I mean, that that hopefully comes through from the report, um, but you're, you're absolutely right about the, the need for something like a grand strategy. And uh, that that not being 
uh, in the report. And your, your, your point on the heterogeneity, so to speak, of Europe, definitely well taken. I mean, my, my conversations have been primarily in Estonia, uh, actually. And, you know, I, I, I would agree completely with your assessment that there's, you know, a kind of heightened awareness there that is not uh, uniform everywhere else. It sounds like the infrastructure of cyber intelligence would be critical infrastructure. <laughs> you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with rip and replace too, we need appropriations to pay for the replacement. You know, here we are several years after rip and replace in local telecom providers, and they've not been able to replace the equipment. So the Chinese equipment is still there because they need to maintain service. And so this is a very expensive proposition that needs to be attended to. Horrible. Uh, you know, apropos of um, your question, uh, you should know that his report is sort of a prelude to a larger project, which we do anticipate assembling a group of people, possibly even in Washington, to consider the conclusions and the data that Matt has offered up and to uh, try to come to some conclusions about what does this mean for us and what we should do. And I want to ask you, Matt, apropos of that, you know, I think that um, during the reckless sort of uh, a very naive period of globalization, when it was always win, 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 and nobody cared who owned what, and it was just one great big commons, uh, we had a version of that in trade, we had a version of that in research, we had a version of that in just about everything. So I look at data through that period, it's kind of like the atmosphere. I mean, we share it. It doesn't have any boundaries. It doesn't have any sovereignty, or at least we didn't look at it in that way. Now, what your report is suggesting is that we need to segregate it into some sort of sovereign territories, and there's some no-fly zones for different countries. Um, how are we going to do that? That is an, a massive challenge. I mean, look, I, I, I try to be self-reflexive as much as possible. And I realize that there is a kind of strange Lovian quality to this topic, because as you say, there's a sense in which data is everywhere. Um, and uh, the idea of protecting it in some way seems very difficult. Uh, indeed. But I think that's probably in a way where the answer has to begin is that we have to begin disaggregating this idea of data so that it has less, you know, or at least fewer of these ethereal qualities to it. And we have a better sense of what we're talking about and where the priorities lie. I tried to do that somewhat in the, the, the beginning of, of the presentation, um, you know, I've, I've had to say several times during this presentation, like what I'm not, because I, I know that there are, you know, especially at a university like Stanford, there are people with deep technical expertise. That's not my background, but it does strike me that digital information, so to speak, has many applications. It's not just there for consumption. It has, you know, again, it, it relates to issues of controllability across systems. It relates, you know, sort of just generally to information that people consume and use. Uh, it, you know, relates to more broadly um, the environments in which people consume information. So when we're talking about data, really what we're talking about is like specific ecosystems. And so I think that's, you know, for younger people in the audience, uh, you know, that that's that's maybe one helpful place to begin from a regulatory perspective. I, I haven't done as much of that in this work, but you know that was sort of vaguely in the recommendations in terms of like, let's start with a list of where we think the priorities lie. We can't treat data as a single issue. Um, and and you know, the the pragmatism of the recommendations was ideally, you know, sort of grounded in a sense that there are some areas that are more sensitive than others, and there are some kinds of information that are more sensitive than others. So, you know, that's that's where I, I would start. But I, I agree with, and I, I love your characterization. This is sort of like 
this is like the hangover after globalization, but from, from an American perspective, because, you know, not all countries experience globalization as win-win and, you know, other countries to the extent that they grew through globalization as well, um, want to continue growing. I mean, that's a sort of basic law of international relations, I, I would think. And, you know, that, that, that sort of sense of a great power competition does not seem to be fully in our strategy or in our institutions. So it, it, yet it's a little like the dollar that we see the re-sovereignization of currency so that the, we don't have one universal uh, currency of the realm, the dollar. People are trying to make Brazil and China and Russia and China. So I think we're heading into this kind of strange world where, where we have to re-sovereignize an awful lot of things. And data is probably one of the most difficult ones to do that with. Yep, I, I can only agree. I think uh, that's right. I wanna draw on a question from the online audience um, in which the questioner, like I think many Americans is not sufficiently convinced that they have more to fear from the Chinese government than they do from American firms or from their own government um, with regard to data collection. And so, you know, with that observation, is not some of the solution here to have a national data regime? The United States, I think, has been fairly um, unique in being a very laissez-faire with regard to the collection of, of data. And that's had tremendous benefit in that, well, American firms have done extremely well and grown very quickly in this area. But of course, the costs are well known to us also. And I wonder to what extent focusing on the end user, that is, say, China versus the United States, um, that's got to be part of the solution, but is not part of the problem also in just the initial collection of this data. Should we not be attacking it from that end of the problem. Um, so, because once the data itself is collected, it can be sold on markets, it can be bought through third parties and acquired. So even if we shut China, if we decouple China from our market, uh, the data can be sold second, third, fourth hand to and Chinese be, firms. And is being. And is being, that's correct. And it can be hacked as well, instantaneously. So simply collecting the data that is dangerous um, is itself uh, something we should be thinking about. So how do we sort of balance those competing concerns, Matt? Um, yeah, no, great. Uh, and, and thank you to the audience member um, who raised that one. Especially speaking at an institution like Hoover, I would be hesitant to jump into, you know, an argument that we need to immediately start regulating um, some of our most valuable industries. Uh, so I would sidestep that solution, uh, <laughs> at least for the time being. Um, you know, as it's not that that's not an important conversation, but I feel like the domestic conversation and the foreign policy conversation are not the same conversation. And we shouldn't treat them like the same conversation. And I think actually TikTok's lobbyists have really tried to, you know, pursue this line of approach that, you know, what we don't need is a TikTok solution. What we really need is a solution for everybody 15, 20 years in the future when that finally gets worked out. In the meantime, what happens? Right. So, I mean, from my perspective, uh, yes, you know, let's let's think about rules that protect people. Uh, I think that's what our government does anyway. Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't lost uh, <laughs> hope or, or optimism in, in that sense. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm more focused on the, the foreign policy aspect of the threat, which is, you know, how, as, as you mentioned at, at the end of that question, Glenn, you know, how um, data moves across borders, you know, feeds into the designs of foreign adversaries, et cetera. You know, that, that to me is a present enough threat that it should not be, you know, sort of like subordinated to a broader conversation around, uh, you know, what, what to do about Facebook. Can I just ask uh, briefly, when I raised this recently, someone suggested, um, why not just ban the export of um, data uh, from American data companies to China? 
we have export controls in other realms. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, fair. I mean, that sounds like a great starting point. That's that's uh, the the basis of negotiations between the U.S. government and and TikTok have been you know over this idea. You know, the the so called uh, Texas project, where you know all TikTok data would be stored by Oracle in in servers. You know, they're located within the United States and whose activity can be monitored and, and controlled. I, I think that is an important starting point. So I want to pull on that thread with another question from the, uh, from the online audience, and that is to get a little bit of Sun Tzu on this. Is there a weakness uh, that we can exploit in China's data strategy? Is there a way into which we can turn this to our advantage? Like Sunza, that's uh, deep. Um, I, I think. Um, look, I mean, this report was very much written in the how can we protect Americans mode. You know, not as much in the how can we disrupt China's systems mode. Uh, to the extent that it makes a recommendation in that latter area, the main recommendation isn't you know for. Um, exploitation, so to speak, but it, it is a recommendation that we, you know, we researchers, analysts, others who care about these issues get serious about the research. You know, everyone I talk to who wants to solve these problems goes right to the point that there is a lack of capacity, you know, whether it's capacity to, you know, sort of map the landscape to you know, compa uh, capacity to enforce the the, the laws um, and you know various actions in between. So I think a starting point to that question is simply you know uh, somewhat to Orville's point about sovereignty, um, having a serious discussion about how to protect sovereignty and protect citizens because the. Exploitation of openness, as I said at the end, there is something. It's not just that the party does it well, you know, because they were an underground organization in Shanghai in the 1930s or, or that kind of thing. It's it's because the party now studies how to exploit openness in other societies, as, as I was saying, to pursue its own ends, you know, whether it's legally, whether it's um, you know, through like setting up groups in civil society that actually turn into tools of, uh, you know, the, 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 the repression of dissidents living abroad. It's exploitation of openness. So getting serious about protecting openness in ways that uh, at the same time make this kind of activity that seems to run like totally counter to democratic values, uh, you know, that, that would be one starting point. Stop, stop giving it all away for free. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me, Terry. Yeah. Could, could I address that? What you just said. There is a book out called "The Psychology of Totalitarianism." It's written by an academic uh, uh, psychologist, and uh, one of his findings is that totalitarianism is associated with the use of models by governments that produce little or no information. So that's one way perhaps we can get out of the bind that we're in. Sure, I know I, I happen to believe that democracies, you know, perform better in, in yeah, the senses that you're describing yeah. because there's a Communism much freer flow a, of information. It's a miserable failure, mm -hmm. which is indicative of the models that the Marxists use provide them with little or no information. That's right. No, and, and there's there's a you know a school of thought that I've encountered recently. You know, it's the sort of like we we did it once, we'll do it again school of thought, but it's not focused on World War II is that we did it once. It's the you know collapse of the Soviet Union as we did as as we did it once in the sense that you know really avoiding war with China, which is you know a, a scenario complex and grave to contemplate um, is a priority. And, you know, the alternative, uh, but still, you know, one that protects U.S. national security over the long term is to 
you know, try to contain uh, China and China's growth in ways that would ultimately, you know, put stress on um, China's society from within. David? Matt, Next question. Uh, Matt, both you and Glenn touched on working with allies and partners. Um, we mentioned that some countries in Europe might be behind the, the U.S. on waking up to this risk. Are there U.S. allies, partners, or friends who are ahead of us on this? I mean, Estonia was brought up. What are they doing um, that maybe you think the U.S. should be doing? Um, you know, Taiwan is another example in my mind of, of, a, of a partner who I think is attuned to this risk and has a lot of experience. Sure. So that, that's, that's great. Um, I think uh, on this idea of data free flow with trust, you know, that's, that's Japan. Um, and so Japan, in terms of the, the kind of like multilateral dimensions of, of the topic, um, is a country to look to as, you know, uh, having proposed under the Abe government, you know, a, a sort of serious idea in response to um, this threat. I think domestically, uh, you know, Australia obviously has um, pursued an agenda of counter foreign interference, you know, that's not applied to China only, uh, which is, I think, an important point to make as well. Um, but, you know, that that has a kind of framework for identifying uh, what malign activity looks like and then uh, attempting to resolve um, those, those issues, you know, through, through law enforcement, um, among others. So those, those are two that come to mind. Um, and Estonia, uh, you know, I, I have had some really important to me conversations with colleagues there. And, you know, I don't know that the model is coming into view yet, but what I find striking is we have, you know, uh, in the world, uh, countries whose populations have like living memory and experience of dealing with large, uh, you know, authoritarian or totalitarian neighbors and, you know, how they've then taken measures to decouple or detach uh, are, are probably worth exploring for sure. Laura, the final question. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew, for your presentation. I want to continue on this topic about third countries. Um, some of the recommendations like strategic decoupling and working with this group of friends might work very well for the group of friends. But I, as you said, that foreign policy is something that you are an expert in. Um, what have you for thought about further, further in terms that, that making that group of friends and creating sovereignty in terms of American internet might increase block farming in the world? And how do third countries have to deal with that? Yeah, that's, I mean, we're, it's a great question. Where China's been successful is in, you know, providing a lot of third countries at, you know, various sort of economic stages, so to speak, uh, with critical infrastructure that they and their populations need to modernize. And I think that that fact shouldn't be overlooked. Um, I think it's probably incumbent on the United States and you know, like-minded uh, countries to propose you know, real concrete solutions um, that go beyond just like, don't use this or don't do this. And I don't think that that side of the policy has been fully worked out yet to put it mildly but you know I, I i definitely see that as a concern and i definitely see that as an issue that requires response that's a great question so i think that brings our event to a close i want to thank you all for some excellent questions great discussion and in particular thank matt for what really is an extremely important substantively rich intervention in this topic as orville suggested this is the opening round, and I think in a much larger push that we're going to build around the set of topics and set of questions um, involving Matt as we, as we really try to move the needle on the discussion. Um, I want to alert those of you in the audience that uh, on April 26th at noon Pacific, we're going to have another CGSP speaker event. Um, Richard Carney will be speaking to us about his new manuscript, China's Chance to Lead, Acquiring Global Influence, via infrastructure development and digitalization. 
I hope you can join us for that. And thank you for coming today.